One of the experiences I trust every homebrewer shares is the feeling of awe that comes from witnessing the conversion of wort into beer through the fermentation process. Even after 15 years, I still get giddy when I see the first signs of airlock activity, a nice fluffy croissant developing on top of my beer. The worst is when this takes too long. You all know the anxiety that comes from checking on a batch a day after pitching and seeing no action. This is why we love Imperial Yeast, who pack 200 billion cells of the purest yeast into each pitch right pouch, which assures quick starts, healthy fermentation, and predictably great results. I strongly urge all of our listeners to check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and let them know that you appreciate their support of the Brewlosophy podcast while you're at it. All right, on to the show. Take a poll of a bunch of homebrewers and ask them what their favorite brewing ingredient is. I bet a large majority would say it's hops. For good reason. Hops are absolutely amazing and contribute myriad wonderful characteristics to beer, from fruity and floral to earthy and spicy. And it seems the number of varieties available to brewers grows every year. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And on this episode, we're going to be focusing on a really cool new hop product you're all going to want to get your hands on as soon as possible. It's called Lupo Max, and it was recently released to the public. Though, little secret, I've had the opportunity to use a couple different varieties uh, of Lupo Max over the last few months. I'm going to be joined by some folks from North America's leading hop supplier, Haas, uh, who developed Lupo Max, as well as some friends from Yakima Valley Hops, in addition to talking about what exactly Lupo Max is, what went into its development, and how to use it. Uh, we're going to be discussing what we think about the beers we've brewed with it. I'm not going to share too much just yet, uh, but suffice to say, it is pretty amazing stuff. I think you're all going to be really impressed with this new product. All right, if you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Coming up on Sunday, July 26th, 2020, Milk the Funk's Dan Pixley will be taking questions from patrons. Dan is a sour and funky beer expert who not only only co-hosts the Milk the Funk podcast, but is largely responsible for maintaining the Milk the Funk wiki, which I'm sure anyone who brews these types of beers has referenced numerous times. Uh, be sure to make your pledge by July 25th to be a part of what promises to be an awesome experience. All past sessions are stored on our private Facebook page, so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to support us is by using the links found at brewlosophy dot com slash support when you're doing your online shopping your experience doesn't change at all and we get a little bit of a kickback that helps us continue to bring you this show and if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review in apple podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcast we would really appreciate it feedback is brought to you by brewers hardware who specialize in tri clover compatible sanitary fittings conical fermenters kettles and brew stands brewers hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers including high quality stainless fittings at great prices with super fast shipping. Learn more at brewershardware.com and make sure to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. Listener Greg Jackish from Florida had some thoughts and a question about yeast harvesting. He said, I recently started listening to your podcast and really enjoy what you are all doing. Well, thank you, Greg. He says, doing some binge listening to catch up. It's good to listen to things other than the world ending. <laughs> question for you and all of your experimenting. I've been brewing for about 12 years now and have never desired to play around with yeast harvesting or rinsing and have always used uh, new yeast packs. Now I'm playing around with both rinsing and harvesting uh, from built up starters because with COVID getting liquid yeast is becoming difficult where I live in Northeast Florida. Uh, all the research says to use the harvested and or rinsed yeast uh, within two weeks. So here's my question. If, say, the time gap will be a month or two between uses, have you ever attempted to lengthen the shelf life of the harvested yeast in the fridge by doing a small starter with it every two weeks to regenerate it, chilling it, and repeating that until the need to use it? All right, Greg, I know this may go against what you and potentially others have heard, uh, but I'm, I'm not aware of this two-week rule. I, I've been harvesting yeast for, man, seven or eight years now, and, I, and, and two weeks, I, I, I don't know where that came from. Um, I don't really see the benefit of propping up 
uh, you know, harvested yeast that often. I've actually successfully used yeast that I've harvested from a starter uh, three months, maybe a little bit more after harvesting it. Um, I, I just use an online calculator to determine how big of a starter I need to make uh, to get the cell count, the cell count that I'm after. And I presume that the amount of yeast harvested is around 100 billion cells. Uh, now, that is seriously just a presumption on my part. I, I've heard from a few folks who have actually counted the cells in yeast harvested from starters. Some say it's way more than 100 billion cells and others say it's a little bit less than 100 billion cells. To me, if it's a little more, I'm okay with overpitching. A slight underpitch doesn't really bother me that much either. I've not had any bad experiences uh, doing it this way. Hence, I stick with with this assumption, you know, of 100 billion cells. I if 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 I weren't able to get to a harvested yeast within three months and I really wanted to keep it around, I'd probably prop it up in a starter just to be on the safe side and, and then re-harvest it and save that, that cleaner, you know, uh, I guess more viable yeast uh, for, for a future batch. But yeah, I, I don't know where this two-week rule came from. And, and unless maybe what you're talking about is pitching it direct without propping it up in a starter first, whenever I harvest yeast, uh, I prop it up in a starter before pitching it. So now I've been using a lot of imperial yeast lately, so I'm I'm not I'm not harvesting as often as I used to. But that is the way that I do it. Uh, thanks for the feedback, Greg. I hope that helps out. If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com, or you can drop us a note on social media. Russian River Brewing Company is very well known for producing some of the best West Coast IPA, among other styles, uh, probably on earth. In fact, I'm pretty sure Vinny Trillerzo is credited as, as being the guy who really spearheaded the whole double IPA thing with Pliny the Elder. Well, for a long time, the only place one could get Russian River beers was in Santa Rosa or you know the the the, the close by cities, but recently they started distributing to uh, my neck of the woods right here in Fresno. So I picked up a few bottles, one of which was their new new ish Happy Hops IPA, uh, and I shared it with my friends. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. Timmy, all right, Jersey. You always go first. I'm gonna go first. You go. I'm gonna tell you the type of the beer. I'm gonna tell you the color of the beer. Don't drink it. I'm smelling it. So mean. But I smell piney, 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 pine. Yeah, IPA. Yeah. Now we're gonna taste it with the tongue. Just the tongue. It's an IPA. Now we're gonna take a Jers gulp. Do it. Oh, Timmy, you don't like IPAs, but you like good IPAs. That's a good ass IPA. That one's a lot better. Don't you like it? It's got a little juice to it. This is good. It is good. Still lingering on the aftertaste. I just spilled half of it on myself. Yeah. It's it's juicy at least. Huh? What do you mean juicy? Well, I just said juicy. What do you mean juicy? Kind of grapefruity. That's that's all I got. Okay, now as a professional, it's totally grapefruity. See? All right. I, I, I got something right. I don't eat grapefruit. Neither do I. One last big sip. Give it a lick. Sip. I think that's really good. Man, I'm going to give it 75,000 jerks. Dang, that's big. I'm going to give it an eight. For an IPA. Okay, so for a total of four. Yeah. You like it, right? It's drinkable, that's for sure. I've had the opportunity to drink Happy Hops IPA a few times now, both on draft and from the bottle, and I am telling you, it is such a good IPA. I definitely get some fruit and piney notes, very classic West Coast flavor profile. I could chug this stuff all day long, a real nice thirst quencher. Uh, the Russian River website says that Happy Hops has an OG of 1056 and an ABV of 6.5%, uh, which by my calculations, puts it at a pretty dry 1006 FG. Totally my style. Uh, you know, I know that there's that's not the fad right now. A lot of people like their higher FG, you know, kind of creamier, uh, hazy IPAs. But man, this one really hit the spot for me. Uh, I don't think I've had a Russian River beer I don't like. Uh, like I said, Happy Hops is a freaking winner. Uh, if you ever have the chance to try it, do not pass it up. All right. If uh, you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage you feel like sending in to me reviewed by Jersey and Tim on the show, you can email me marshall at brewlosophy.com and we'll get you all set up. When we come back from this short break, I'm going to be joined by some very smart people from both Haas and Yakima Valley Hops to talk about what they've been up to lately. The 
The brew in a bag method has blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAB experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high quality, food safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all in one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at check out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. In the nearly two decades I've been brewing beer, I've, been, I've seen a bunch of new hop varieties take the market by storm, and it seems like every year some new hop varieties uh, are released. Lately, it seems a bit more focus has been on innovation in the hop business, with companies developing novel hop products that aren't your typical flour or pellet, uh, but offering brewers something new and exciting to use in their beer. One such innovative company is our guest on this episode, Haas, uh, who has... I mean, you guys have been around quite some time. Uh, you guys, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Why don't we start off... Uh, with you guys telling us who you are and what it is you do. Okay, great. My name is Phil Cho. I am the director of Brewing Solutions at John I. Haas. And with the Brewing Solutions group here, we do a bunch of different functions. Uh, sensory is part of what we do. Technical support for customers uh, is another key aspect of what we, what we do, as well as uh, an education piece where we hold a Hops Academy every year. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. And I'll turn it over to Jeff. Yeah, I'm Jeff Daly. I run the sensory program here at Haas that uh, Phil mentioned. I also handle quality intake during harvest. So I review the hops as they come in from the various har uh, farmers to make sure that they're as good as possible. That they're all true to type, that sort of thing. Now, Jeff, I, I have to cut in because you and I have an interesting history, uh, <laughs> or, or Brewlosophy and Jeff Daly have an interesting history. Uh, you actually had were, were working on a blog with our Jake Houlihan when we plucked him from that, and Haas ended up getting you. I'm not sure who got the better end of the deal there, but uh, <laughs> so you're, you're friends with Jake Houlihan. Yeah, Jake's great. Um, it's Process Brewing, RIP. It's still up on WordPress. We're still getting hits every now and again. People seem to still like my Buckwheat Hefeweizen. Oh, yeah. I remember um, reading about that. Yeah. Back in the day, Scott Janish highlighted that one on his blog for some reason. It's, it's a good beer, but I don't know. <laughs> I think it's because um, Scott likes using different grains in his hazy IPA, and maybe Buckwheat was one that... Uh, well, maybe I'm going to have to review his new book again, uh, the new IPA, and see what he has in there. If not, I'll, I'll send him some notes like... Version two point of that book, you need to include buckwheat, man. <laughs> well, now you're the 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 sensory the associate sensory scientist for Haas, which I think is a pretty rad gig. Uh, we've had the opportunity to check out what it is you're up to over there uh, last harvest season. Uh, also with us on the line is Yakima Valley Hops Caleb Schwecki, of course, uh, the host. You might have heard his voice on uh, the Late Edition podcast. Uh, Caleb, what's going on, man? 
Uh, only good things. Although I haven't recorded any new episodes recently. So yeah, I'll, I'll make a new year's promise maybe one of these years and actually stick to it. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. We're all waiting for it, man. I don't, I, I can speak for most of our listeners. I think are probably waiting for a, a, the late edition, uh, episode to drop as well. So yeah, for sure. Pretty much, uh, on, yeah, weekly we get emails like, Hey, you know, maybe time for a new episode. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do it. Yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, I, I figured what we could do is before we jump into talking about Lupomax specifically, uh, we could talk a little bit about the history of Haas because it's a very rich history. Uh, and you know, I, I don't think a lot of home brewers really know just how much of what they're using today uh, comes from a lot of the, uh, I guess, research and the innovation of a company like Haas. Okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll dive in on that one. And, uh, you know, Haas is, is definitely, uh, has, a, has a lot of history. Uh, we share roots with our, our German compatriots over on the other side of the pond. Uh, definitely been growing and selling hops over, over a few hundred years now. And uh, in terms of our current mission, we're really flavor focused and providing uh, and trying to provide flavor that helps brewers achieve not only their, their flavor profile targets, but in, in able to do, enable them to do it in a way that's easier for them as well as provides uh, more efficiency. And mm. you know some of the some of the products that we've released over the past few years include. Uh, uh, Flex, which provides bittering, Incognito, which provides uh, uh, definitely uh, some very good varietal aroma uh, like Citra and Mosaic. And then, um, and then this product that we're going to be talking about in, in a little bit, Lupamax. Yeah, a Lupamax is a really exciting one for me. Um, all of that stuff. I, I know that uh, when we were up in Harvest last year, Jeff, we went down to the, uh, I guess, the sensory lab. It's basically just a mm -hmm. pub at Haas. <laughs> but, um, and there was all kinds of cool stuff. I think, it, I, I don't know if it was, were you guys the ones who developed Provoke as well? Because I believe we were having some uh, Provoke beers too. That was our, our German team, actually. They, they were the masterminds behind that particular blend. Uh, our focus has been more on uh, traditional varietal focused uh, flavor products. So, you know, we develop brands like Citra Mosaic, Sabro, especially through our partnership with Jason Peralt, Yakima Chief, the mm -hmm. uh, HBC hot breeding program. And it, then it's from that that we find optimal uses of these varietals, right. so whether it's like Phil mentioned the incognito, which goes in the whirlpool and is just amazingly, it punches you in your face. I think we're still working uh, with Caleb on a way to get that to the home brewers at some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's an incognito yeah. is the one that can be used. Uh, if I recall correctly, that's, that's one of the ones where we were served the beer and we're sipping on it. And uh, whoever it was that gave us the glass was like, there was no actual hop flowers yep. or product used in it. It's like a liquid, right? Yeah, that, 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 was, that was our master brewer, Virgil McDonald, who's has a storied history all on his own in the industry. Uh, but yeah, he did the same thing when I interviewed uh, last May. He's like, here, I don't like normal interviews. Have a beer and we'll talk about it. Hey, hey. Yeah, this is good. X, Y, Z, talk about the sensory. Uh, would you guess that there are no hops in this? And then I fell off the stool because this is just gobsmacking that he's been able to pull off stuff like that and that you know, because of products that he's helped us develop, that our innovation group has developed, you're no longer uh, losing as much to, you know, uptake by those dry pellets. You know, you aren't losing the wort, you aren't losing the end beer. So you can have as much as you possible to drink out of your own, you know, kegerator at home. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Phil, I heard you mention, uh, you, you use the term efficiency and wanting to help brewers brew more efficiently with hops. I mean, efficiency is a term that gets thrown around a bunch in brewing, right? And mm -hmm. my understanding is on the, from the perspective of, of a hop company like Haas, uh, efficiency really does mean uh, getting as much yield, uh, or basically reducing losses uh, as much as possible, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially in this current economic climate, you know, everyone's looking for efficiencies, ways to to cut costs. Yeah. And, um, you know, a, a product like Incognito with no vegetative matter, and I might just qualify it. It is hops. It's just hops with no vegetative matter. Right. Right. <laughs> and. Uh, um, that uh, enables the brewer to actually reduce their beer losses, as well as, uh, you know, in the end, they're going to be able to have more beer to sell because they've lost less during the process. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, it's so cool to me to think of, you know, where 
for a while there. I mean, I've been I've been in the brewing thing since 2003. And uh, up until probably five years ago or so, the most exciting thing was just the announcement of a new hop variety. And everybody wanted to get their hands on it. One of my new favorites lately has been Brew One. Uh, just a phenomenal variety. Absolutely love it. Especially mixed with a little bit of Sabro. I think there's something special about that. <laughs> um, but lately, it's been new hop products. And I don't know if that's the proper terminology. That's what I'm calling them. And it, it, it's for an old guy like me who's been so, uh, uh, I guess... I've been drowned in just hop varieties and wanting to keep it real with that. These new hop products are kind of hard to wrap my mind around sometimes. I mean, um, like you said, the incognito is just a liquid that you add to the beer. It's made from hops, so it makes sense that it ends up making the beer taste hoppy. Uh, but it's just really cool. And, uh, you know, Haas has been doing this kind of innovation, whether it's for hop products or different hop varieties, for hundreds of years, right? I mean, it's it, you guys go way back. Oh, yeah, yeah. And like I said, our roots lie in in Germany. And, uh, um, you know, we, we also work with, with our German colleagues quite closely. Uh, and, you know, in terms of, of flavor, you know, what the, what the ultimate end customer uh, will notice is that what they don't notice is that, you know, um, that their beer should deliver the flavor of like Citra and, and they shouldn't know that it didn't come from a whole hop. That, mm wasn't any vegetative matter involved. So right. uh, we feel like we've done our job. If the, if this, if the customer drinks his beer and says, wow, that's a great citra beer, even though uh, incognito was used to hop that beer. Yeah. It, it's, it, and that's the thing, right? Is, is there's, there seems to be kind of two lines of thinking when it comes to developing these, these, these newer hot products that reduce the vegetative matter. One of them obviously is the yield, like we talked about, but the other one is the, the flavor impact that too much vegetative matter can have. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? I don't brew too much hoppy IPA. That's not really, I, I tend to do the simple, you know, light lagers, but um, you know, there's, there's a lot is particularly in the dry hopping uh, too much vegetative matter has been linked to you know grassy notes or or some undesirable you know, off flavor let's let our sensory guy jeff kind of speak yeah kind absolutely of so that. i was hoping i could field this one because not <laughs> only does a lot of green matter in your dry hop especially late cold dry hopping result in extracting those grassy kind of you know fresh but it's not it's not the hop flavor that you want on top of that all the polyphenols from that green matter are sinking in there. So when you talk about, people are talking about it more and more hop burn. Mm. Uh, one of the major potential components for that is the polyphenols from those hops coming up, drying out your mouth and just stripping it down to giving you this astringent burning in the back of your throat. And, you know, if you have less of those polyphenols, less chance of that harsh bitterness killing your mouth and more opportunity to get like the desirable flavors out of those hops, like the, Big pineapple, yeah, big pineapple punch out of the brew one or the coconut as sabro, you get rid of those things that are in the way of your flavor. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that whole hop burn thing. I think. Uh, I think some people don't realize that's what they're experiencing when they drink a really hoppy beer that they don't like. And it's not the flavor or the aroma. And I've been with people who say that. It's just the way, it, the, the, the feeling it leaves in my mouth, that, that astringency that a lot of people refer to it as bitterness. But really, to me, it's, that, it's this fuzzy astringency that, like you're saying, I, I guess just comes from too much vegetation being in uh, uh, the beer, right? I mean... Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're working on those studies to determine exactly which polyphenols down the line, because you do notice as a brewer that you're more likely to get that astringency from one variety than another. So hmm. there's probably a specific polyphenol involved. But in general, you're if you're doing 10 pounds per barrel, like some of these brewers out on the East Coast for these hazies, which we love, it keeps me employed. So please keep doing it. <laughs> keep buying those but hops. If you're yeah. doing that, it, it doesn't really matter if it's a low you know, polyphenol A hop, because you're putting 10 pounds per barrel in, so yeah. you're going to get enough in there either way. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, Caleb, on the on the home brewer scale, you know, are, are there people who, I, I have to imagine that there are folks out there who are, uh, you know, on the internet, obviously, a lot, and they've heard about a lot of these innovative products. What's the interest uh, that, that home brewers are expressing in these new products? Uh, we get We get a lot of emails, text messages over social asking for incognito because we do 
We do offer it to our wholesale customers right now. Uh, you know, we buy it in two kilogram jugs from, from John I. Haas. So that's how it comes packaged from them. We are working on like a delivery method for home brewers, you know, so whether it be like those little oral syringes, like we use for the CO2 extract, the, the hop shots, um, you know, there, there's a little bit of science to it. Um, because from my understanding, you know, it's, it's all, it's all acids, you know, so there are some considerations for the kind of plastic that we use. There are some considerations for like shelf life and other things like that. So we are working on, you know, a proper packaging, a proper, uh, you know, dosing. Yeah. Uh, we just can't, you know, give people like, you know, homebrewers like a two kilogram jug and say, here, you know, go brew something with it. So <laughs> we are working on like the units that make most sense to homebrewers. Sure. But um, I mean, really like incognito, like, it is really good uh, for maximizing flavor and efficiency at the professional brewery level, but even too for home brewers because you know if you're if you're submitting beers for competition, you know you're going to be submitting the same recipes over and over and over again. So you're yeah. going to be looking for those same you know raw material inputs to give you a consistent, reliable uh, beer that you can present that you can submit. Otherwise, you know, there are the home brewers that we work with and they're brewing on one, two, three barrel systems. Like mm -hmm. there are people that brew, you know, pretty much at, on the same scale as professional breweries. Yeah. So, you know, then too, they end up getting, you know, some extra pints. They end up getting an extra corny keg that they can keg up and drink with their friends as opposed to just losing it to vegetation. Yeah. There, <laughs> it's funny because you, uh, the, the whole homebrew scale argument is used quite a bit, uh, you know, and, and w one of the things that I've heard is, well, you know, a, a loss of a half a gallon for a homebrewer is nowhere near as uh, expensive, uh, really, uh, as a as a, an equivalent loss for somebody on a 15 barrel system. Yeah, that's true. But I don't know many homebrewers who want to lose a half a gallon of beer. You know, they, they want to get, they want to sap as much out of each batch as possible. And so if, if using a new hop product that promises to uh, basically impart beer with the same punchy hop character that they're that they're expecting and they get more yield I, it's a win-win right oh for sure and you know too like if you are brewing in your in your house like you're the person doing all that work you want to be able to reap those rewards you right know, if you're brewing professionally in a brewery it might affect the bottom line in some way you know getting five or ten percent more but also, too, like if you make it, you should be able to enjoy it. Amen. Couldn't agree more. Now, let's move into talking about this novel hop product that was just announced. It's it's now currently available uh, for professional and home brewers called Lupamax. So, yeah, Lupamax uh, is is a concentrated hop pellet that, what, that we're bringing out. And uh, I'll have to apologize in advance because there's going to be certain words and terms that that I'm gonna use that we're gonna repeat over and over. So consistency, reliability, true to type, concentrated, all of those words really are get at the heart of what Lupamax is. And, and basically, um, you know, one of the linchpins that, that Lupamax is based on is its consistency. So it's gonna be the same year in and year out uh, in terms of alpha total oils. So we're concentrating the lupulin, the alpha total oils, removing a portion of the vegetative matter and doing this in a, in a consistent production manner such that year in and year out, Citra Lupamax, for instance, is gonna be, uh, if you use it last year, it's gonna be very similar uh, this year. So, and also I, I need to mention that it is crop year specific. Um, and then, uh, Jeff, if you want to add uh, some comments to that. Yeah, absolutely. So part of that consistency comes from our Sensory Plus program uh, that I'm managing, where I mentioned that I'm handling the quality intake. So when we're looking at the universe of lots of hops coming in, and we know that we need to select a certain amount for Citra Lupamax, Sabra Lupamax, Mosaic, and whatever varieties were coming out down the line, you know, we have an idea year over year of what it needs to smell like, just like the professional brewers out there. Uh, we have the benefit of actually having hard sensory data that we can look at, but, you know, I can go in and flag certain lots and say any of these would be appropriate based on the sensory characteristics. Of course, some of those might be taken by brewers because we don't jump to the front of the line just for our product. You know, we're customers for ourselves, just like everyone else. So we aren't hmm. taking food out of the brewer's mouths. But if we can get one or two of those five that I flag, then it goes over to our 
you know, industry leading team at the processing plant. And that's where like they have the magic to make these concentrated pellets happen. I can make sure it smells right. I can make sure that it's the right alpha and oil content and, and things like that. But it's them taking the sensory and then using their techniques to optimize how it's concentrated down so that you know you end up with a pellet that works like a normal T90, but you can use less of. Other concentrated pellets, it just concentrates down to the point that it almost falls apart. And that unfortunately concentrates too much flavors that are undesirable. So you go big OG, big vegetable, because you're concentrating down all those sulfur compounds huh. just to try and get as much alpha into a pellet as possible. But we're taking a step back from that to make sure it's optimal so that you are getting that consistent flavor, that it does work without getting that nasty garlic in your beer that you then have to sit on for a couple extra weeks to age out. Nobody yeah. wants that. You got to keep churning product out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, I like how you said, Phil, that the consistency is one of those words you're going to come back to. And I think for very good reason, uh, you know, I'm a home brewer. I don't sell my beer. I give most of it away, in fact. Uh, but even for me, I want to know that if I made a beer two years ago that I really loved, I can go back and make the same thing again and have a very similar experience. Um, on the commercial scale, you kind of have to have that uh, for your customers because they demand consistency, whether they think they do or not. Customers <laughs> demand having a product that they expect, right? When they're putting that beer to their lips, they want exactly mm -hmm. what they're expecting from it. And it sounds like, it, it, again, we're going to dig really Really deep into the Lupamax stuff when we come back from our, our break, but it sounds like the goal of a lot of these new hot products, uh, including Lupamax, is to give brewers the ability to improve their consistency batch to batch. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you compare Lupamax to some of the other concentrated uh, hot products out there, like T45s or some of uh, some of the other competitors, uh, you know, one of the things that really really distinguishes Lupamax from, from those other products is the consistency. So you're, you're gonna, if you know what the alpha is in 2019, crop year 2020, you're gonna know what the alpha is in this product. And it's gonna be similar lot to lot, um, year to year, all of that stuff. So, you know, and it's not such a, you know, real big thing, but, you know, as a brewer, you don't really have to redo your, your recipe calculations really dramatically because of that consistency. So, so every little bit that you can help the brewer do their job a little easier, a little faster is, is great. And, and plus, since it's concentrated, it's less to lug up a ladder and dump and things like that. So yeah, so like I said, every little bit helps. Yeah. I, I was, uh, yeah, I, I've got a lot of friends who are in the uh, commercial brewers, you know, and uh, they're doing that kind of stuff. And they're constantly talking about, you know, ways that they particularly making these hazy IPAs. I mean, they are so hopped. Uh, ways that they can reduce that vegetal matter with the goal really of imp increasing their yield. And this sounds like a dream uh, for so many of them. Uh, we've do, we do have to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be digging into more details about this unique new product, as well as sharing our thoughts on beers made with Max. We'll be right back. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature control fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to grainfather.com, that's grainfather.com, and get started today. 
Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Brewpod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Attention beer drinkers and thinkers. Put that mash paddle down for a second. Let me ask you, do you like to cook outside? Do you love the smell of charcoal and barbecue? If you've answered yes to any of those questions, I think you should check out the Grill Coach podcast where we discuss all things barbecue and grilling. Join us on our mission where we aim to learn, teach, and share the amazing world of grilling and barbecue. So grab a homebrew and join us. We think you'll find our perspective on the world of outdoor cooking unique. You can find us online at thegrillcoach.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Instagram at the grill code from this home brewer to you get out there and grill so we spent some time discussing what exactly lupamax is uh, very generally i was hoping you guys might be cool with sharing how it's made obviously without giving away any proprietary information as well as uh, some experiences that you've had using lupamax and drinking the beers that you've made with it okay great so in terms of uh, the process, how it's made, uh, that's proprietary. So if, if I told you, I'd have to kill you as well as all your <laughs> listeners. But uh, um, so I'm not going to tell tell you that. But uh, we can we can uh, say that it uh, you know definitely relies on on partly the expertise of of our uh, manufacturing team. Uh, so um, the the people that that make Haas pellets, they've got years and years of experience. And uh, we, we hear that our customers think that, that the Haas pellets are, are, are some of the best in the industry. And that knowledge extends to uh, the Lupamax production. And uh, so uh, we can say that, you know, a lot of the processing is done cold uh, to ensure that uh, the lupulin doesn't degrade. And uh, in other words, the alpha and the total oils don't degrade during the process. And, uh, you know, the process is configured such that we provide the maximum amount of alpha and oils without creating pellets that don't have really great pellet integrity. So, in other words, it's, it's not too soft, it doesn't come apart, but when you actually use it, it disperses well. And, uh, you know, we definitely compared uh, how how Lupamax pellets uh, compare as far as dispersibility uh, to other other uh, competitors on the market, and uh, and it it uh, you know it performs like an ordinarily ordinary T90 pellet would would perform. Yeah. So uh, you know so in, in those respects, uh, Lupamax is great. If you think about uh, a sustainability argument, since it's concentrated, uh, you're going to use uh, less. Uh, of Lupamax pellets compared to T90 pellets. And so the implication there is not only in the fact that you're gonna gain efficiency by losing less beer, but you're also gonna be generating less solid waste hmm. going out of your brewery, which uh, which is definitely a great thing for, for uh, you know, in terms of um, uh, waste uh, going to your uh, wa- uh, water treatment plants. Uh, in terms of shipping and storage, you're gonna need to, uh, your, at least your shipping costs will go down, and that has fuel implications as well. Uh, your your storage space requirements are going to go down, and uh, that definitely has some energy implications in terms of refrigeration. So, so there's definitely a sustainability argument, and uh, in terms of flavor, you know, Lupamax brings a really concentrated flavor uh, to your to your beer during your brewing process, and so if if I had to tell you 
what the uh, uh, comparable uh, replacement rate is uh, for Lupamax versus T90 pellets. Say you're using 100 grams of, of T90 pellets, for instance, uh, you would replace that at a 70% rate with Lupamax. You would only need to use 70 grams hmm. of Lupamax. So, so there's, a, there's a mass savings there as well. Um, we offer it in Citra Mosaic Sabro. So if you're looking for flavor profiles uh, from those particular hops, they definitely deliver true to type uh, varietal flavor. And uh, maybe I'll let uh, Jeff speak uh, more in detail on, on uh, you know, beers, beer flavor, sensory, all of that stuff with these products. Well, I, I will say uh, I, I had the opportunity to play around with some Citra uh, Lupa Max a couple months ago. And in fact, uh, we, we brewed up a batch that we were going to release at the same time that this uh, episode that came out uh, for the Hop Chronicles. But unfortunately, COVID-19 kicked in and we can't collect data anymore. So we ended up drinking that whole keg, uh, me and Paul, who, who brewed it ourselves. And, and I'll just tell you personally, opening that bag of Lupamax, first, I didn't expect to see pellets. I didn't know what I was expecting, but it just looks like a regular T90 pellet. Um, they, like you said, they're, they're, they're perfectly compact. they they dispersed beautifully in the boil, uh, did, did very well in the dry hop as well. But I, the pungency that came from that bag when we opened it was like, no, it, it was like walking through a Citra hop field. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, and, and, you know, I think a lot of brewers have come to expect what you smell is what you end up getting in the beer. And yeah, I mean, I wouldn't attach a percentage to it, but, but certainly, you know, a 30% increase in pungency is probably what I, what I would say that I smelled in that bag when I opened it It was phenomenal. Well, and, and I'll jump in here too. So like Marshall, you know, you said at the beginning, like you're a cranky old man, like it's (laughs) kind of tough to like wrap your mind around, you know, all these new oils and extracts and top notes and bottom (laughs) notes and like all these different advanced hop products. This one is really easy to wrap your mind around because it is a pellet. Exactly. the Citra and Mosaic that you know and love, it's just better. Yeah, it's more powerful. Yeah, that's a great point, Caleb. And for cranky old people or home brewers that just <laughs> haven't the benefit of buying all of the equipment, they're, they're people like me still with the Igloo cooler. Because Lubamax is so much like a T90, you can use it just like a T90. You don't have to worry about getting some sort of pump to recirculate whatever alternative uh, pellet that you're putting in there for the dry hop. You just throw it in it's dense enough that it, you know, falls about halfway down, then it disperses just like a T90 does. It doesn't yeah. float on the top. It doesn't sink the bottom. So on top of putting necessarily less in, you're getting more efficient extraction as well, because that hot matter is staying in the beer and the beer is doing its job to pull those flavor oils out. Whereas if it's at the top or sunk to the bottom with all the yeast, you, you just wasted, you know, $15 in whatever pellet product and you aren't going to get as much flavor out of it to begin with. So it's, we definitely optimized every aspect of Loop Max to perform as best as possible uh, to both, you know, reduce loss, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, from my end, create great flavor. Yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned not being able to collect sensory data and me being in charge of the sensory panel, you can understand how that's been a little fun to figure out with COVID. Uh, you know, normally we have about 30 people on our train panel and we pared down to me driving around town with little igloo coolers full of little bottles of beer to about <laughs> half those people. Oh. Uh, and so we've done this with a bunch of Lupo Max beers pretty recently and they're loving it too. And that's how we've been able to say also flavor wise performs like a T90. We've been able to match that spot on across all the flavor attributes. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very impressive product. Um, so, uh, you, you know, Phil, you mentioned uh, it, that you can use about 70% of what you would with a typical T90 pellet. Uh, there's been a lot of talk lately, uh, you know, Dr. Shellhammer's research out of Oregon State and all the stuff he's doing with the eight grams per liter, like dry hop saturation point thing that, that if you're using more than eight grams per liter, you're really, it's like diminishing returns. With, with a product like Lupamax, is the suggestion then there that if you're going to dry hop with it, uh, dry hop at 70% as well? Or can people, I mean, I, I suppose that this would take some more research, but can people use up to that eight grams per liter and get even more pungency in their dry? I mean, can, you know, I'm, I'm imagining if you're not putting as much vegetative matter in there and you're reducing that risk of hot burn and that astringency that nobody enjoys, that you can, you can increase that, the hop rates, the dry hopping rate to get even more pungent hop character. Well, certainly to, to answer your first question, definitely if you're, you know, you can use that 
rule of thumb, and I, and I want to emphasize that it's general rule of thumb. People need to uh, play around with this product to really find their own sweet spot. But um, as a general rule of thumb, if if uh, you know you you're you're dry hopping at three pounds a barrel, you can you can with T90s you can use Lupamax at seventy percent of that level. Now in terms of whether this will be able to deliver. Uh, you know, more hop flavor at, uh, at eight grams per liter or higher, <laughs> that question still remains to be answered. So, uh, I don't necessarily want to paint myself into a corner here and say, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and, uh, really, I think, you know, how, how much you want to add is really dependent upon the brewer and, and, you know, as well as I do, brewers love to experiment, brewers love to, you know, in a lot of cases, add a, a, an obscene level of hops, which we love, by the way, as yes. Jeff said. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, uh, that that question, uh, I guess, remains to be seen. I, I would think that for the commercial brewer who is dialed in their recipes, the the key uh, thing of focus for them with using a product like Lupamax would be reducing, uh, increasing yield and thus reducing the amount of hops needed, which I, I would imagine, I mean, I, I would imagine that balances out cost, which ultimately though, if you're increasing your yield, you're actually making more off of that beer. So, uh, again, like I said, it just seems like a win-win all around. I mean, it's such a cool product. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So if you, you know, pencil out, uh, you know, all the costs involved in brewing, uh, the cost of work, the cost of hops, all of that stuff, uh, at the end of the day, with that um, savings in reduced beer loss, you're, you're coming out ahead. And to a commercial brewer, that really adds up to some bucks over, you know, production run of a, of a year. Uh, you know, all those dollars definitely add up. And, you know, I mean, even to a home brewer, you know, every little bit helps, right? So, <laughs> Heck yeah. You know, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I just might add that, you know, this product since, uh, you know, we're in partnership with uh, YVH, uh, you know, something that, we aren't limiting to say big commercial customers or or big craft breweries. It's 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 going to be available from the smallest of the small home brewer, you know, all the way to the to the the really big guys. Uh, we will be we will be launching the Lupomax uh, in homebrew sizes: two ounce, eight ounce, and pounders, as well as the wholesale packages in 11, 22, and forty four pounds. So yeah, home brewers are going to be able to get to use it uh, the exact same day that all the professional breweries are going to be able to use it too. So you know, as far as like input, uh, tell us how you brew, what you brew, what you like, you know, how it works. So the home brewers are really going to be, you know, integral to the success and development and just figuring this product out. Like you guys have spent years and years and years, you know, researching it, brewing with it. But, you know, getting that mass of input is going to be so valuable. I've heard uh, uh, so many times that. Uh, professional brewers, as well as other other industry experts, uh, learn so much from the home brewers' experience because, you know, on, on many levels, it's safer for us to go out and mess around and experiment. And then you've got people like us who are collecting data on it, and and more than willing to share it. And then you, you know that you come up with this nice, you know, big experience bubble that you can then use and go, and it guides, uh, you know, maybe decisions that you make in the future. I know you you said right now we're kicking it off with Citra Mosaic and Sabro, which a good good varieties probably to start with. I would imagine. <laughs> um, in when in thinking of those three, um, you know, I, when I think of those those three hop varieties, I'm thinking you know fairly high alpha to start with very, very oily, right? Um, and those are the two things a lot of us are looking for. Does the 70% thing carry over for alpha as well as oil content? Or do those things stay equivalent, basically? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, definitely when we talk about the 70% replacement of Lupamax or T90s, we're talking about both the alpha and the, and the total oils. And so uh, keep in mind that it's a general rule of thumb. Uh, but in the trials that we've run uh, internally here, we found that uh, this 70% replacement rate uh, is a good general rule of thumb for the amount of Lupamax you would need to replace your T90 pellets. And that's talking about uh, from a bitter standpoint, as well as from a flavor standpoint. That's really awesome because it may, it really does mean that that when somebody picks up uh, some Lupamax, that they if if they just decrease their usage by about thirty percent, they're they're about they're bound to get 
uh, which is a big chunk. Uh, they're bound to get this, the, a similar uh, quality bitterness as well oh, yeah, as yeah, flavor. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, and from a flavor outcome, flavor profile outcome, both from the bitterness perspective, as well as aroma and then all the flavors associated with that aroma, uh, you do that 70% replacement, you should have a pretty good flavor match for T90s. Yeah. And, and I think a good point to make here is that Lubamax can be used uh, on its own. I mean, it, it is a it is a bittering uh, uh, product. You can use it for, for flavoring. You can use it for aroma, for the dry hop. This isn't like other products where it's recommended to use it just for flavoring or just for bittering. Um, this is an all around. I mean, it covers the whole gamut. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, you know, anywhere you use T90, you can use Lupamax. Right. And I guess really the only exception I would say is Bright tank because it's bright. You don't want to be on <laughs> by, by adding the pellets to it. But uh, and then, the, then the other piece of this is that uh, certainly you can add it at the beginning kettle boil, but then you're going to lose a lot of the aroma through uh, flash off of, of the bottles. And, and so maybe I wouldn't recommend adding it at the beginning of kettle boil because uh, you're probably not getting, <laughs> you know, the biggest bang for your buck because it's a little more expensive than, than T90. So, right. Uh, but but like I said, anywhere you use T90s, you can use Lupamax. You don't need specialized dosing equipment, as, as Jeff mentioned. So it's, it's pretty, pretty easy, pretty straightforward product to use. You know, I got, I got to say, though, Phil, um, I'm an old enough home brewer that I remember the, the first wort hopping craze, you know, throw the hops in the mash, throw it in the first. I'd, I'd be interested to see how Lupamax does in that. So any home brewers uh, out there that try that, shoot us a line because I'm yeah, really Yeah, curious. absolutely. And then from the varietal perspective, we certainly want to hear feedback from, from anybody who tries Lupamax and, and hear what varieties that they would like to see in, in coming years. Because, uh, you know, right now, Citra, Mosaic, Sabro, you know, we could, we're, we're definitely planning on adding varieties. So tell us what you think or what you want. El Dorado. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say El Dorado, Simcoe. I'm still, I'm still up on Simcoe too. I know that's an old school one now, but uh, mm-hmm. uh, so, so Jeff, have you done? You, you said you were traveling around serving uh, Lupa Max made beers. When you guys are are doing the sensory stuff uh, for these Lupa Max beers, are they 100% Lupa Max that you're having people evaluate? Or are you guys doing like bittering with something else and then just uh, you know punching it up at the end with with Lupa Max? Yeah, we do do a little bit of bittering on the on the, the beginning of the boil with our flex products, that, mm-hmm. that liquid CO2 extract, um, pretty similar to what you get in those hot shots that YVH has when you heat it up and it's nice and liquid. Um, but that's very neutral. There's no flavor addition there. It's really pretty well stripped of oils and all boils off anyways in terms of flavor. Yeah, then we just we hit the whirlpool with a good dose. Um, our trial this time around was two pounds per barrel T90. So that was 1.4 pounds per barrel Lupamax side by side in a split batch, just like you guys do. Uh, and then you know, ferment them out for about a week, week and a half dry hopping, you know, one Play-Doh off of terminal, again, with two pounds per barrel each or you know, the equivalent condition for a couple of days. And then, yeah, I ran it through panel um, each of these varieties a couple of times just to make sure uh, you know, we don't do the, you know, the triangle tests, which everyone loves. Uh, well, <laughs> we do not during these circumstances because it's so much harder to do when you can't even serve to people. You're trusting that they have the bottles and put it in the right order. And, yeah. You know, we, we do our, we, we do our descriptive analysis. So intensities across mm-hmm. the various flavor attributes, which is, you know, industry standard for this sort of thing. But what are you guys finding so far with, uh, I, if you, if you want to break down the, the different varieties, that'd be fantastic. I'm, his personal uh, interest, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, Citra Mosaic performed just like Citra Mosaic. You know, uh, I think with Mosaic, you get a, it's not significant, you know, the value of 05 or anything, but there's uh, there's a little bump in the berry character oh, cool. from that Mosaic side. Citra is very close, maybe a little bit more floral. Uh, Sabro is our favorite little mutant. Um, it's, you know, you like Sabro. Loop Max is even better. It's so creamy and it just kicks you in the teeth in such a really nice way. Um, you know, I'm not going to say use even less for your replacement, but hypothetically thinking about the flavor impact, I would say you could maybe do a 50% replacement rate just with how amazing Saburo is. You don't, you don't need that much just to get, if you're looking for that normal flavor, but by all means, 10 pounds per barrel of Sabro Lupamax. 
I'll, you know, I'll get me my paycheck for the next six months. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think about things like um, with Mosaic, there was a while, probably four or five years ago, where uh, people were talking about how that tends to impart kind of like a diesel-y, you know, um, almost a, a fuel-like uh, character to, to, to beers when used at certain amounts and, and certain rates. Is that and and in fact, I just heard from uh, another home brewer uh, earlier this week who who used a fresh batch of, of mosaic and was like, "Man, I, I thought I loved this stuff, but I'm not sure anymore." Uh, is that something you know? Is like, is that going to be intensified as well, or or is that one of those characteristics, those types of things that kind of get pulled out when you're doing the Lupa Max uh, process? So, in terms of flavors like that, you know, diesel or you know what people are used to call dank, but I've, I've been on. Instagram lately, I've been hearing hop stink. Is, is that what the kids are calling it now? I've never heard that, but um, I like it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, that that's that's lot by lot, uh, brewing technique by brewing technique. Uh, generally, we min- we try and minimize some characteristics like that through that initial quality intake because because that's so specific and kind of rare. Uh, we try and screen that out because we don't want you know, one batch to come through that's completely different than the others. Um, we don't want to say, oh man, that twenty that 2020 Lupo Max mosaic was great because it was super dank, but this year's, we, we just don't want that sort of variation right. in terms of the flavor attributes. So we want it to concentrate down and give a punch with the flavor attributes that matter. So with, you know, mosaic, it's, there inherently is going to be a bit, little bit of dankness, but it's that, it's that big citrus, ripe, almost too ripe, garbagey, tropical fruit, and then, you know, <laughs> berry and cattiness that just comes through with maybe just a little bit of OG just to let you know that it's there. <laughs> I love that about Mosaic. I don't, I don't know how people yeah. don't like it. One of my favorite uh, single hop beers I ever made was a Mosaic Blonde Ale, dry hopped. I mean, you could call it a pale ale, but it was blonde. Uh, yeah, and it was fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm still a huge lover of Mosaic anyway. So, uh, well, we had the opportunity um, to, like I said, before we brewed with the Citra Lupa Max, Paul, uh, the guy who heads up the Hop Chronicles for us nowadays, uh, brewed a batch we couldn't collect data on, but we thoroughly enjoyed it. And I would, I mean, that beer was, it, to me, the way that uh, Paul and I were, you know, sitting around talking about this thing, because this was right, he brewed this right before the, the quarantine went into effect. And the way that he was describing it was like Citra times five. It was like this weird experience where it was more pungent. We used quite a bit less uh, than we might normally use in a typical Hop Chronicles beer, which are very simple. I mean, this is, I believe we go 90% pale malt, 10% Vienna malt, and that's it. We ferment it with something like Imperial Flagship or, you know, the Chico strain or, or something just nice, clean, dry. And so you're really, you can only focus on that hop character because there's not much else there. A lot of times when we make these single hop beers, you're like, okay, yeah, I get the hop character, but it's kind of boring. I'll either give it away or dump it because it's not very exciting. We couldn't keep our hands off of this Citra beer. So it, our experience was that it was really great. Well, we, you know, Jeff, uh, Jeff Perkins from Yakima Valley Hop sent us a pound of, I think it was Perkins. Maybe it was you daily. I don't know. Uh, well, I gave it to Perkins, Jeff to Jeff Transmission. <laughs> telephone, right? So, but we ended up with another pound of the Mosaic uh, Lupo Max. Too recent for me to have a pint in front of me right now. It is in the fermenter, uh, but but I was able to get a little sip from Paul, and uh, I'm telling you, it's the same experience. None of that 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 hop burn that you would expect from such a punchy hop beer. Um, I have no doubt that that especially home brewers who are making these really hoppy, whatever kind of hoppy beer you like, whether it's hazy or clear, I prefer the latter personally, that they're not going to be able to keep their hands off of this stuff. Well, and Jeff too, you touched on this a little bit, um, but a lot of it comes down to selection, right? You know, so there's like, you know, 10, 11, 12,000 acres of citra planted this year. Not all of those acres are equal in how they present, how they brew, so it's, it's up to you guys, you know, to select the lots that are true to types. And I think that is like a really important thing. Could you talk a little bit more about like that true to typeness and, and just picking the correct lots? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, that's frankly one of the benefits to Lupamax that we don't talk about quite as much or don't phrase it in the way that I've thought about it, where for a lot of customers, you know, you can't come out to do selection like some of the big guys. And so at least with our industry experience, we've got a team of, you know, there's myself leading the sensory program and then a lot of great people that have years and years 
learning and knowing what true type is. And we work together on that sensory plus team. And so we're doing the selection for you. Um, and I, I think that's, especially for home brewers that always want the highest quality, they never know if their Citra is gonna be good or not. With something like Lupamax, we're narrowing it down and saying, hey, you know, we're a professional team. We think that this is the bomb. It's gonna be the bomb next year too. Um, and it's through filtering down years of experience, professional sensory analysis, and then the, the processing side, turning these into a consistent pellet that you can use without ever changing your recipe, or at least not too much. That's what it comes down to getting that consistent beer. And, you know, I just want to add that, uh, you know, we have a pretty, pretty awesome uh, quality department here, as well as an R&D department that has really sophisticated instrumentation. And the other piece of Sensory Plus is this chemical analysis of of the hops that are, that are incoming and being selected for for uh, production into Lupamax. That's a great point, Phil. We'll we'll have to get our Marshall on this podcast sometime. Right. <laughs> Dr. Marshall Laguerre. Uh, he's, I think I like to nerd out about hops, but he is he is something else, and I love working with him. Uh, he, he's in charge of that. He's developing these great methods to help us create not just you know a, a target for what alpha we're going to hit, but at least a range of some of these flavor compounds in the oil that we should see in terms of ratios to make sure that the flavor analytically matches. And so that will be substantiated against my sensory team. And when those line up, we're going with that and we're going to make the Lupamax. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Caleb and I have talked about this a few times before that one of the biggest complaints from home brewers when it comes to buying hops is that we're at the bottom of the barrel, right? And I think Yakima Valley Hops has done a good job of uh, making that less so. And it sounds like with a product like Lupamax, everybody's getting the same exact product at the same time, right? The, it, it eliminates that piece of it, that people aren't coming in and stealing the best. Eh, they deserve to. They're commercial brewers, but they're taking the best that there is out there. And then whatever's left over is what home brewers get. Not, not so with Lupamax. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing, too, is that Lupamax is crop year specific. So, you know, exactly how old it is, which, you know, if you're saying consistency, 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 but then also adding in the crop year too, you know, how old it is. So you can calculate any degradation if you need to. Although I have a feeling everybody's going to brew up with Lupamax in the next week or so. so <laughs> yeah, and there's not going to be any <laughs> sitting around. Um but yeah, you know, the, the consistency does matter. And even going back to like that lot selection, you know, that is something that we run into year, year in, year out. You know, we have 10 different core samples from Citra, all, you know, lots all over, you know, the, the tri-state area. And we might find one lot that is just like awesome, you know, like the Citra smells like papaya and whatever else. And it's really, really juicy but that's not necessarily consistent. You know, it's not true to type. So we do, you know, from the Yakima Valley Hops perspective, we do try and pick the true to type lots, make sure that people are getting consistent varieties year in, year out. But this Lupomax does just make it so much easier. You know that you're getting, you know, like the first pick stuff. It's going to be great. It's going to be good. You have professionals like Jeff, you know, sticking their nose in there, making sure that it's exactly what it needs to be. And you can brew, yeah, you and can brew with that. Yeah. Constantly. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but just want to add that, you know, in terms of home brewers getting the dregs, this will not be the case in terms of Lupamax because they're going to be buying from the same lots that the, you know, the commercial brewers get. So it's not going to be, oh, well, here's the crappy stuff. We're going to send it over to YVH. It's going to be the same, you know, it's going to be Not that same. we ever did that. Um, not that no, we of course not. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the same lots, uh, you know, and, and the, you know, the, from the same pool of material yeah. everyone gets. So it's going to be totally, uh, uh, totally not the case where, where homebrewers are going to be at the low end of the, of the totem pole. Excellent. It's good to be on equal footing with all those commercial brewers for once, you know? <laughs> well, we are coming up on the end of the episode here. Uh, I was thinking maybe we could finish up by talking about where brewers can pick up uh, Lupa Max and maybe even spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the cost of this, this uh, new product. Well, in terms of availability, uh, you certainly can um, buy direct from, from Haas if you meet... Uh, meet our, our, our requirements for size of, of the business. Uh, and then also through our, uh, our distributors, uh, uh, like YVH, um, uh, Willamette Valley Hops, um, 
you know, and then it, it, as well, you know, this is not going to be a product that's going to be limited to North America. Um, it's certainly going to be a global global product. And so, if if you happen to be in in other countries, uh, go to your go to your hop distributors there to to try to find this product. Um, in terms of pricing, uh, that I think uh, is something that. Jeff is pointing down to you. I'm, I'm pointing down to Caleb. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, why, yeah. YPH has its Caleb's own probably, targets on what it's going to yeah. price out for their margin. Oh, yeah, for sure. And yeah, so uh, home brewers, you can hop on yakimavalleyhops.com. Uh, the Lupamax, Citra, Mosaic, and Sabro are going to be packaged in the two ounce, eight ounce, and pounders. And pricing, uh, we're, we're looking at, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're looking right around twenty nine ninety nine for the pounds um, and then, you know, break it down from there. And, you know, that does translate price wise uh, to be pretty comparable to the T90, for, yeah. you know, as much as you're getting out of it. Um, and it is, you know, it is a pretty complicated process. Uh, I know Phil couldn't share a lot of it, but it is, you know, a really complicated process. So there is a lot of tech that goes into it. There is, you know, a lot of raw materials that go into it. So it is a little bit more expensive in, in that regards. Uh, professional breweries, you can hop on spothops.com to grab 11 pound, 22 pound, and 44 pound uh, there. We don't have enough Sabro uh, to offer that wholesale right now, uh, as far as my understanding is, but we are offering the Citra and Mosaic. And we do have, we do have, you know, a little bit of Lupamax to go around this year, but it sounds like it's kind of just going to be like an initial, like, test, you know, wet people's appetite for it, let yeah. them play around with it, kind of figure out how to use it. And then after the domestic harvest, you know, so, uh, you know, September, October, uh, probably get it around November, maybe, then we'll be offering the 2020 crop uh, of all these varieties. So really looking forward to that. And then, you know, there's going to be a ton to go around breweries. You can, you can give us a call. Uh, we don't have any minimums, but if you do want to take out a contract, uh, buy some hop futures, that's absolutely an option as well. So if you want to try it out, maybe do a couple test batches now, you know, plan for the future and secure some for the future. You can uh, shoot us an email, uh, sales at yakimavalleyhops.com, and we'll be able to get you hooked up. And I just want to say, in terms of the the cost of this stuff, it's funny that at, at a dollar eighty eight per ounce, uh, anybody would complain about such an awesome hot product, particularly given the varieties that are currently available of Lupamax. I I, I, w I was buying hops in two ounce uh, portions that were, to be honest, terribly stored, you know, from a local homebrew shop that cost me four bucks and they're crap. I mean, come on, Willamette or, you know, whatever at a dollar 88, get a whole pound for 30 bucks. Are you kidding me? You're going to love this stuff. I can't recommend more that all of you listeners out there hop on it now because I don't think there, you know, there might be a lot right now, but it's not going to last forever. People are going to love this stuff. Uh, it's incredible. And I, I am so excited to try Sabro Lupa Max. I love Sabro. Uh, I, I would hope my, my vote is for a brew one Lupo Max. So whenever you guys get around to doing that, I'd love it. Um, <laughs> Cause I think that the, again, that the mix of that, I love pina colada. And so the mix of that Sabro and, and uh, brew one is just so incredible to me. Um, and I'm also really excited to, to drink my first pint of the mosaic Lupo Max that Paul has going over at his place right now. So, uh, well, thank you guys so much for coming on the show. That is all the time that we've got. Is there anything else? Else, any of you want to say about Lupamax before we uh, wrap things up? Give it a try. You try it, you'll like it. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> we've talked about. Yeah, and for all the listeners out there, uh, honestly, yes, yeah, shoot, shoot Caleb an email, shoot Marshall an email, shoot me an email uh, with whatever varieties that you want to see in Lupamax in the future. You know, we're we're gauging what we hear from our customer, the professional brewer side, but we can't forget how important the homebrew community is. Most of the people out there that I know that are professional brewers started out as homebrewers. So their opinions on flavor matter as much, if not more so than some of the people that are brewing hundred million gallon batches of beer. <laughs> uh, Marshall, you did, you know, mention kind of like the pricing and looking at, I'm not going to compare it to another product that's already out on the market because it is different in many regards, but there is another product uh, that sells for like $4.99 per ounce. So even, even at the 29 per pound, it is better. Uh, it is crop year specific. Uh, some of the other products are not crop year specific. So you don't know if you're getting old stuff, new stuff, maybe a mixture of stuff, who knows. 
And again, you know, selection, it does matter. Picking those prime lots, making sure that it's true to type. Uh, yeah, really excited for Lupamax. Absolutely. Uh, I, I completely agree. And again, I can't wait to, to use it more and more in my brewing. All right. Well, you can keep track of everything Haas is up to at johnihaas.com. And don't forget to load up as soon as possible on all of your Lupamax needs at yakimavalleyhops.com. The Brewlosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.